So welcome everyone to the second day. Uh, we have a sparser audience, but uh, I'm pretty sure many people are just fashionably late. Um, so anyway, uh, we will start today's session, uh, today's uh, conference by an exciting session, which really, uh, I think, meant a lot for many of us. So the session, so actually today's session is really a panel, kind of panel and session mix. Uh, so we have a great we have a panel of uh, four experts, great speakers. Um, I, I will introduce them one by one when they give their talk. So the format is that each of them will talk for 15 minutes, um, around 15 minutes. And then we will after open the discussion uh, to the floor. And uh, the, the theme of this uh, session or this panel is uh, bridging theory and practice. I think, again, this is, this is a topic particularly important to many of us, uh, well, actually all of us statisticians who actually want to go to the world and make an impact. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Liz. It's Liz Stewart, and uh, <laughs> well, I, I didn't look at the program. I, I know all of you. So, um, so Liz Stewart, many of, well, of course, I think everyone knows Liz. Liz is the professor of uh, um, mental health and biostatistics statistics at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And uh, she's also the associate, associate dean of uh, uh, education in the School of Public Health, and uh, as many of you know, that the Liz has done just a tremendous amount of work in, um, in terms of translating the the causal inference methodology to the to, to practice, and the, the the impact is really cannot be uh, underestimated. So, so we are today. She's going to talk about something she recently done uh, about mediation analysis. I'll actually, show you a somehow a grim picture of uh, <laughs> the gap between theory and practice. So, Liz, please. Thanks, Ben. Um, it's really great to be here. Thanks for this. I'm super excited about this session. Um, sort of topics that we don't always talk about explicitly. Um, but I'm really excited to be here. And I've, I learned a lot yesterday, so I'm excited for day two. Um, right, so what I'm going to talk about today, I'm sorry, let me start my timer so I can make sure not to go over. Um, I am going to talk about this, uh, what I see as a disconnect between what we all in the causal inference world talk about in terms of mediation analysis and what actually gets done in practice. Um, I realized actually, like yesterday, that there's not a session on mediation um, at the conference, which there could have been. You know, it's a big topic in the causal inference world, as many of you know. Um, but there, it doesn't happen to be one. But I'm going to assume a basic level of knowledge about mediation. The goal of the talk is not to talk about the methods. Um, but as many of you know, uh, there's basically been skyrocketing interest um, from the statistical kind of causal inference community in methods for mediation and analysis. Um, there's also been skyrocketing interest in application of mediation approaches in the applied literature. And as Ben said, I work in mental health and substance use, substance use primarily, but also education and sort of social and behavioral science in general. Um, and it's just been very clear to me that these two worlds are, have not really found each other. So that's what this talk is really just going to quickly summarize. Uh, so this is a slide just showing Google, Google Scholar entries for mediation analysis in the title or text. Um, and basically the, whole, the only point here is just to show that sort of rapid increase, um, both with Google Scholar overall, but then also PsycInfo, um, and just increasing interest over time. Also, what really prompted my interest in this work is that I sit on some review panels for the National Institute of Mental Health. And NIMH, in their um, clinical trials request for applications, has this language, where they basically require mediation and moderation analyses in their clinical trials. The motivation is that they want to learn about the mechanisms of action. They want to sort of be able to understand, well, if a, if a treatment doesn't work, maybe we can help figure out why it doesn't work. Or, does it work better for some people than for others? They want to sort of get under the hood of their interventions. But what was striking to me is that it was very clear in the applications coming in and even in the conversation in the review panel that people in that world didn't understand how hard mediation really is. It was sort of a, oh, we'll do this, and like, yeah, here's a few sentences, and oh, it's all fine. So it just became really clear to me that there was this disconnect. So I um, basically wrote a grant to sort of try to bridge this gap. So the goals of the, of the overall project are to document current mediation practice in psychology and psychiatry. That's what I'm really going to focus on today. 
We also will do some methods development sort of specific to mental health. Um, and then really a third goal is this sort of dissemination and trying to bridge this gap. Again, this is the part I'm really not going to cover, uh, so I apologize if you have no idea what I'm talking about mediation. But fundamentally, this is the like, I don't know, cliff note sort of little slightly loose uh, discussion of mediation. The general idea is that we have some exposure, intervention, treatment of some sort, T. We have some ultimate outcome, Y. And at a sort of vague level, we're interested in sort of examining whether the effect of T on Y sort of goes through M. And I could talk for hours about this. Um, I'm not going to. That's not the point of today's talk. Um, but it's sort of this idea of trying to disentangle like direct effects from indirect. And again, there's a huge literature on this that many of the people in this room work on. Um, well, not quite this. But anyway. So there's this traditional approach to what's known as the Baron and Kenny or sort of triangle method for mediation. Again, I'm not going to get into this, but this is what like psychology and psychiatry people do all the time. This Baron and Kenny paper from 1986, I, I checked over the weekend, has been cited 90,000 times. It was actually 88,880, which was kind of fun. Um, and anyway, it basically involves fitting a series of linear models, uh, you know, sort of the if, like t to y, t to m, m to y, and just sort of putting the, the coefficient values together in certain ways in a way that sort of aims to understand these links between these three variables. Uh, the sorts of questions, though, from the causal perspective, one of the challenges with that very Kenny approach is it really is not tied to well-defined causal parameters. It's very tied to sort of the linear model structure, and the parameters are defined only in relation to those linear models. Like, there's not really an interpretable causal estimate that they are targeting. Well, there is, but it's not obvious. So there's a whole growth in sort of causal mediation methods that try to start from what we are all more comfortable with, start with a causal estimate, and then figure out how do we estimate that, with less focus on a very specific sort of set of linear equations. So the sorts of causal questions, and again, I'm a little bit loose here, but it's sort of like if you could block a path, what is the remainder of the effect? Or if we could, if we could fix the mediator value at a specific value, how does that change the, the effects and things like that? Again, purpose today is not this. But basically, the whole Baron and Kenny approach is incredibly popular, as you'll see, in psychology and psychiatry. But it sort of it ignores confounding pretty much. There's one paper that they wrote where like, they do acknowledge confounding, but all of the applications since then sort of ignores it. Um, there's this assumption that it sort of it, this embedded assumption about there's no treatment by mediator interaction in sort of most of the approaches. There are sort of these hidden assumptions if you really want to interpret things as causal. And again, it's not clear what's being estimated. I realize, let me say one quick thing about mediation, which is what makes it hard, which is that um, the one of the challenges of mediation is that even if you randomize the treatment, M is not randomized. So it gets really hard to disentangle the different effects. And even in a trial, we can't sort of necessarily estimate well the thing we want to estimate. And that, I think, is fundamentally one of the points that people forget. So again, a causal approach is sort of built up in this area um, where the idea is to be more, more explicit about what are the effects of interest. And I have a site at the end um, to help. If, if some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, just read the paper that I'll refer to at the end. But again, the goal is to really clarify the estimates, clarify the assumptions, um, and develop methods and disseminate those methods uh, for those. And I don't have a slide on this, but these methods are increasing incredibly rapidly. Like, I think in 2018 there were at least 50 papers on mediation in the statistics literature. But really what I'm going to really use my eight minutes left is what does the mediation and out mediation look like in practice? So what we did was we took the top 15 journals in psychiatry and psychology, um, all the papers published from 2013 through 2018, this, um, and we looked for ones that had mediation in the text or title, or sorry, abstract or title. It's 206 papers, and we extracted basic information about these papers. So, Point number one, what methods are being used? Uh, this graph shows on the x-axis the year, y-axis is the proportion. The um, red at the top is the sort of traditional Baron and Kenny kind of structural equation model series of linear equations approach. 97% of papers are using that. 
Um, we looked at it by year because I thought, well, you know, the causal stuff is newer. Maybe, like, maybe in 2018, more people are using that because there have been some software packages developed and there has been some efforts towards dissemination. But no, across time, except for a weird little jump in 2015, it's about 3% of papers in this literature that are using any of the causal approaches um, that all of us work on. So five of those used uh, some software that Koske Imai and colleagues wrote. Two of them used a Valerian Vanderbilt software. But like 97% are using the process macro in SPSS written by Chris Preacher that basically implements um, the Baron and Kenny approach. Okay, really quickly, this is again very high level basic. There are three main types of assumptions that underlie mediation, and in particular, the Baron and Kenny kind of approach. Temporal ordering, for causal inference, we like temporal ordering. Confounding, and again, because the mediator is not randomized, we have to worry about confounding even if T is randomized. So we we'll, might be worried about confounding with TY, TM, and MY. And then some model assumptions about things like linearity, functional form. So I'm just going to really quickly um, go through each of these. We didn't even address whether they were interpreting the resulting effects sort of in a reasonable way. So that's a whole harder can of worms. So, point one. About half of the studies didn't even have temporal order. So maybe they had cross-sectional data. Maybe they were trying to make scientific arguments about what came first. But in reality, their T, their M, and their I, and their Y were all measured at the same point in time. 23% of studies had full temporal ordering of T to M to Y. Um, and it was the case that temporal ordering is more common if this was in the context of a randomized trial where T was randomized. So that helps, because that implies that there at least is longitudinal data available. Okay, so not doing great on the temporal ordering. Confounding. Do they talk about confounding? Do they just run confounders? Sometimes. So about 60% of these studies controlled for any covariance in either the mediator model or the outcome model. In this context, the baseline mediator and the baseline outcome are probably the most important things to control for. And about like 14 to 16% of these papers controlled for you know, the baseline mediator or outcome. So confounding, and we'll give it a C, maybe. What about other assumptions? Do they even talk about the fact that there's this no interaction between T and, uh, I mean, yeah, t like T and M, or sorry, I'm mixing notation, X and M here, T and M. So 23% did at least talk about this linearity assumption embedded in this approach. 2% uh, uh, examined the assumption of no interaction between treatment and mediator. 42% discussed the assumptions at all. So over half didn't even discuss the assumptions. Um, and 2% did sensitivity analysis to any of those assumptions. Okay, so there we go. This is our, our marching orders, I would argue. So basically, how should we as methodologists think about this? I would just, you know, here's evidence that current use of mediation in psychology and psychiatry is very far away from where we want them to be and where many of our methods and approaches are trying to get them to. We're sort of arguing about the details of, like, so this is just my like little <laughs> uh, soapbox here. We're arguing about the details of this causal estimate or that causal estimate or this type of effect, that type of effect. The applied literature is way back here, not even realizing that they have to account for confounding and that they need temporal ordering. Um, so how can we bridge these worlds? And this is what I would love this session to sort of talk more about. Um, we need to disseminate our advances. I mean, I think we do sometimes a reasonable job at making our packages Yesterday we heard about a very cool shiny app, but somehow it's not enough. Like, I don't know, and this is partly what my grant is aiming to do, and I know Beth Ann and Donna Kaufman and others are doing this in mediation as well. But we really, if we want our methods to get used, we have to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, there are a ton of open questions that we don't have time to get into today. Um, I think I'll just leave these here, and then I'll end with this slide. I really want to thank um, Chang Yuyen, Ian Schmidt and Elizabeth Sarker, who are all students at Hopkins who helped a lot with the literature review and sort of the, the, um, really doing all the extraction. Um, funding thanks to NIMH. And then um, just wanted to point out this is, that link at Columbia is actually a pretty nice overview of mediation. And I thought if, if you want a starting point, it's, it's a pretty good one. And then that Nguyen paper, I just want to give a sort of shout out to because it really, um, it's on archive now. 
basically tries to make sense of all these different causal S demands and sort of translate them into which ones are appropriate for different applied questions, because there's sort of nuances around that. So um, that paper really tries to do that. Um, and then the final one is just an example um, for sort of an epidemiology audience of um, talking through mediation. So great. OK, two minutes left. Thank you very much. And she's also the um, co-director of the comparative effectiveness uh, methodology at the DCI Duke Clinical Research Institute. Um, and uh, Lane has Lane is, uh, really has done a lot of important work in terms of uh, influence the uh, methodology called influence methodology in particular cardiology. And Lane is the person who taught me that, that there is stuff more than just methodology. Um, so. So then today we'll talk about some interesting things to listen to them. Thanks, Grant. Um, huh? My mic doesn't seem to be working. Cut, cut, I cut, the, uh, cut the thing on. Did you cut it on? No? How about yeah. that? Is that better? OK. Um, thank you for the introduction, Fan. That was really interesting, Liz. Um, instead of drilling down into one topic today, I've given a quick high overview of three places where I'm interested in methodology and the bridging of methodology and practice. Um, I definitely have the same experience with mediation analysis. I was amused that recently I had a collaborator that wanted or was talking about mediation analysis, and, and I mentioned, you know, oh, there's a lot of development in that space in causal inference right now. Um, there's cool methods, and uh, the 1986 method was that was the advanced one. They said, oh no, we don't want to do anything complicated like that. So like regression was that was too complicated. We wouldn't go that far. Um, and I have this in my talk, but I want to mention it just because it's on my mind as a transition between the two. One of the things that I think about um, is that uh, a lot of times when I bring up issues to collaborators or things like these new methods of mediation analysis or other causal inference methods, um, there's generally this, we've, uh, Duke had a huge influence in this, but moving away from the word cause in the applied literature, about, I think 20 years ago, Rob Caleb really pushed the medical journals like JAMA to uh, ban the word cause from observational studies. And a side effect of that is that if you never say the word cause, then it leads people to think they're not doing causal inference. And so a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll bring up a causal inference method and they'll say, we can't do that, this is observational data. You can't do causation in observational data. And uh, I've, there's a nice paper by Miguel Hernan about the C word and it's in one of my slides, but I loved that paper because it was what I felt was so needed to start bridging the gap is your purpose is cause, you can still be really cautious in your conclusions because your conclusions also involve all those assumptions, but if the, if the conclusions would be useless if they're not causal, then your purpose is cause. And I think a big challenge right now in the applied literature is because, you know, I can see why we don't want the New York Times to be splashing the word cause on the front page when an analysis is done an association and observational data. On the other hand, um, I will bring methods to my collaborators and there's a big resistance to do anything that's related to causal inference methodology because that's, that's for randomized studies. Um, and so I think that's one of my thoughts that, that connects with the mediation and it also connects with some of, the, some of the examples I have. So I just wanted to quickly give a background on some of the kind of projects I work on and the applications. Uh, I'm the PI of the CHAMP HF registry here. It's a registry of patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction and heart failure. Uh, and it's an uh, industry study. So we're looking at, there's a, uh, Arnie here, Supercontrol Valsartan, is the drug um, that they recently had a trial on. And now it's a registry that's just doing academic work. So we're still doing a lot of causal inference, though, because they're interested in things that were studied in the randomized trial. Um, so this is just an example of medications in this, you know, project in that registry looking at kind of what kind of medications are patients getting in practice. And then some of the papers that are coming out of that registry are causal inference, trying to understand what we didn't look at in the trial. So there's a bunch of papers there. Another project I work on is Compare UF. This is PCORI funded. Um, and it's looking at 
treatment options, procedural options for women with uterine fibroids. Uh, and the treatment options for these women include things like hysterectomy. So they will never have a randomized study because women would not want to be randomized to hysterectomy. Um, and so at the same time, because of that, there's very little evidence around these procedures. What, should you, what procedures should you get? So I work on a lot of these projects where we really need causal information. People need to make treatment decisions, and randomized data won't be the way to go. Um, and so I, you know, working in that space, feel very comfortable with the need to kind of move towards causation and do it as well as we can. Um, and so there's a bunch of studies that we're you know, putting out recently comparing hysterectomy, myomectomy, and other interventions in Compare UF. So those are just two examples of kind of the observational world that I work in. And then the next couple slides, I just want to touch on some themes that I'm seeing across a lot of projects that are of interest to me right now and I'm doing some work on. Um, one is that uh, we have the opportunity to look at new user design. So for like probably 20 years, causal inference people have you know, clearly established the principle that you need to start follow-up when you start treatment. That you don't, if you take, you know, baseline treated patients that happen to be on treatment when your data set starts, you've missed a lot of the outcomes of interest. And that's been known to us for a really long time, but for, you know, 10 years ago, I couldn't sell that point because our data sets were too small to look at new users. If we, if we identified new users and started follow-up at the time of inception, there would be too little data to study at all. So I was kind of between a rock and a hard place. We know that we don't we want a new user design, but we didn't have the data to do it. One thing that's really changed over the last five years is we have a lot of big data sources. So we're looking at Medicare claims, big pharma data sets. And as data sets get bigger, we have less excuse, I think, to design badly. We have this opportunity right now to use these big data sets to design studies better, the way we always knew we probably should. Um, and to, you know, big data sets have some disadvantages as well. They don't always have as good covariate information or accurate capture of uh, characteristics of the patients, but they do give us the opportunity to design better. So I'm interested in methods around, um, you know, treatments that are initiated during longitudinal follow-up in a data set. Um, and I won't go into the details of that today. I just wanted to touch on it. Um, that includes things, though, just because people in the room are familiar with these methods. Things like marginal structural models, um, and the paper that's written at the bottom here, I have a paper under review that's looking at ma matching methods for longitudinal data. Uh, and so I'm interested in how we can use big data to design better. Uh, another topic of interest that I've been working on with FAN is internal validity. I would say you could, there's other ways you could frame this. You could also say treatment equipoise. So when you do a clinical trial, you don't enroll patients if there's no equipoise. And there's you know, a very narrow definition of equipoise in a clinical trial, which is you have to be totally willing to randomize patients. If you know that one treatment is better than the other, it's not ethical to use randomization, you can't enroll those patients in your trial. So then, in a trial, you might have to be pretty narrow in what you define as equipoise, like 50-50 is a fine thing. In observational data, um, you don't have to be so rigid in the concept of equipoise, but the, the concept is still relevant, I think. And it's more so another trend, again, with big data, real-world data sets, um, people can be inclusive. And there's often a, a perspective that the reason we're using real-world data is to be more inclusive, because trials are perceived to be very exclusive. Sometimes we clinical trials are designed narrowly to have the best chance of success for a drug, which is fine. And sometimes that means they don't include all people in the population that might be of interest. So we want to be more inclusive and go study that question again in observational data. That's often the goal in these real world studies. Um, but the downside is that once we start getting inclusive, my collaborators um, couldn't, can't agree on how inclusive to be. And there's a general trend towards being as inclusive as possible. Like, this is awesome, we have real world data, we're gonna include everyone, we're gonna include babies in our cardiovascular study. Like, there's just extremely expansive inclusion criteria. And so, you know, I noticed talks yesterday, they started with the premise of we have a population. In most of my data sets, that's not even a, a reasonable premise. Like, we don't have the population. We have a really big convenience sample and a debate about how narrow we should go in defining the population. And there's a million options for the population. And so, as I've been watching this over the past few years, one of the things that causal inference people would say, the, the group I came from at NC State would say, 
Go back to the inclusion exclusion criteria, revisit who belongs in your sample, make sure that you have a logical target population with using the science, using the characteristics of the patients to make exclusions. But over the you know, recent trend, I've found that, that even if we try that process, we still end up with a really inclusive population that I can't quite believe is the target. And so an example of what happens is if we're doing like a cross-sectional study with a propensity score, so we have the probability that patients get treated, I see distributions like this all the time, which is a bunch of people, like a huge peak of patients have almost zero probability of receiving one of the treatments, and a huge number of patients have almost 100% probability of receiving one of the treatments. And we go back and we try to, you know, discuss inclusion and exclusion criteria and make sure we've been as, you know, logical as we can, but the, everyone turns to me and says, this is real world data, we want to be inclusive as possible, you're the statistician, tell me how inclusive we can be without compromising validity. What does that look like? And so, I, you know, there's some methods like, uh, FAN has a method called overlap weights, there's matching weights, but there's movement towards this concept that the, the, the IPW that has always looked, targeted the ATE, the average treatment effect in the population, might not be the only target of inference that we're interested in. And in the context where I see these really broad questions, and we want to use real data to be as inclusive as we can, then I think that the ATE is not always the most interesting target. And so I have some work here, there's a paper referenced at the bottom where we've been looking at other ways to um, define the target of inference in other populations. And there's a lot of advantages to, especially in these data sets like this, there's a, a lot of advantages to that, both conceptually and statistically. Um, and another topic that I'm interested in, kind of at the crossroads of methods and um, application is target trial emulation. I think there's a lot of ways you could say this. That's a phrase that um, I think has been coined at Harvard. Um, but there may be other groups as well. Uh, there's a lot of versions of this lately. But the reason I'm so interested in it is I have a number of applications, kind of like we've seen, five minutes, perfect, kind of like we've seen in the nurse's health study, um, where I think that's a pretty famous example where home run replacement in observational studies was looking like it was beneficial. And then after, you know, the clinical trial came out and said hormone replacement was actually harmful, it caused cardiovascular disease. And then, um, a, you know, a more careful analysis using a well-designed observational study replicated the trial. I see the same thing in two examples. These are just two from my work. Um, in, the, in the middle column, in the first column, we have the clinical trial results for warfarin on bleeding and staph and cardiovascular events. In the middle column, I have an observational analysis kind of conducted as I would typically see. This, the middle column there would get, the methodology would get published in JAMA. It's standard methodology using a propensity score. And we see the wrong, completely wrong result. And then if we redesign the study, making sure to emulate the target trial of interest, same covariates, same outcomes, same adjustment variables, nothing, nothing special about the confounders or the data changed between column two and column three except the design. Uh, and so target trial emulation ends up giving me numbers that look much more compatible with clinical trials. And I keep seeing that in multiple examples, which makes me think that we fixated on <coughs> unmeasured confounding as the only problem in, in observational data. And it is one problem, but it's not the only one. So with probably four minutes left, I'll give just a couple comments on what I think some of the risks are that are running across these areas. Um, one risk, the one I mentioned earlier, is the hidden purpose. Um, if we aren't comfortable saying we're targeting causation, it's hard for statisticians, especially applied statisticians, to advocate for the use of causal inference methods. Um, another uh, trend, I think, is the need to differentiate quality in observational research. Uh, there's often a perception that if it's observational, it's bad, if it's a trial, it's good, and that we can't differentiate observational research, and I think we really can, and I think that the fact that it's so differentiable needs to be more clear. Um, and then sometimes I also see <laughs> I like to the phrase putting lipstick on a pig. When we're developing novel methods, um, I think that we have to still be careful that novel methods are not layered on a bad design. And I think some of the big opportunities in this space are, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of advantages to guidelines, things like the Robbins tool and the tripod. Tripod is not for causal inference, it's for prediction. There's a Robbins eye tool that's for evaluating the risk of bias before doing a meta-analysis. These tools do lead people to good practice. There's a great tutorial on um, moving towards best practice and weighting that Liz wrote. 
And I see that referenced all the time by pharma and by uh, collaborators. Once those tutorials are out, people do adhere to them. Um, but we need to be really clear on the scope and limits. So that is sometimes a problem as well. The tutorial has a boundary. It's not applicable to everything. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to engage with pharma and the FDA. I've noticed a lot of interest from pharma lately to seriously do good observational research because they have they have a goal. They want to get, eventually start using observational research to reach the FDA and to, to you know, actually reach regulatory level approval. So I think there's an excitement there and a willingness um, that I've seen. And then the last topic, last one minute fan. <laughs> um, the biggest thing that I think we can do as well is to focus on transparency. Um, that methods won't get used if they're not transparent. When I'm a collaborator, I'm interested in novel methods. When I'm a reviewer, I'm nervous about novel methods because I have to establish confidence that an analysis was done correctly and interpreted correctly under really limited time constraints. And so I have to be able to see the building blocks of that method quickly and make sure there weren't a lot of mistakes. Um, and so the, to the extent that we can make sure our packages help interrogate the assumptions and reveal the building blocks of our process, anything we can do to increase transparency as we're putting out methods, that's something our, we've been working on lately, graphics to go in our package to make sure people can see who's in the target population, who's excluded. Uh, the more we can make the, those things accessible, people will be willing to adopt methods, I think. I think that's one of the reasons for resistance. Um, and so, I think, probably I'm out of time, but... 20 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds, we'll wrap it up then. So I just want to you know, point out that there's a lot of dimensions to transparency. Sometimes we think about a few things, but what are the graphics and descriptive data that would help reveal mistakes? How do we communicate generalizability? Was it clear to begin with? The example I mentioned, my population is not the population. Did we alter it? And finally, our assumptions and our purpose. So what are the principles we're starting from that uh, are essentially implicit assumptions? Making sure those things are transparent, I think, will help people adopt new methods. So that's about it. Thank you. <laughs>
data is so difficult? What are the different statistical challenges we have to be able to address? Then I'm going to share with you our approach to evaluating the relative performance of commonly used methods in the field. And I'll give, share a few of our key findings from a recent simulation study we did in this space, as well as share implications for practice. And then I'm going to end on focusing on this issue of we need new methods, we need better methods in this area, and we also need to do a better job at disseminating our methods more rapidly so they get adopted. So there are several key challenges to actually ro robustly estimating causal effects of state-level policies, whether it's an opioid policy or a gun policy. Uh, first, we have selection bias that exists in the data because states who are implementing a policy systematically differ from the states who are not in very meaningful ways that can bias the results if you do a naive analysis. We have sparse data. <laughs> this is a sample size with a maximum of 50, and we can't get over that. But policymakers cannot wait. <laughs> they need us to tell them where the evidence and the strength of the evidence lies. So we have to deal with that limited sample. We also have policy heterogeneity. What the way a state policy is implemented in one state is going to look very different than another state. And it's hard to figure out exactly what's happening and why the, or yeah, exactly what is happening to make that treatment affect heterogeneity, as well as to try to model it well. Uh, we also have the big issue that states are implementing many more than just one policy at a time, particularly right now with both crises happening in opioid and gun violence in the U.S. States are implementing laws related to both and trying to tackle and help both. So we have to tease out all of these issues, hopefully with one model. Um, so from a causal inference perspective, what is the goal when you're doing state-level policy evalu evaluation? Basically, we're just trying to estimate the causal effect here, we need the counterfactual. So we need to understand what would have happened among states who implemented a particular new policy had they not implemented it. And so what we did, similar to what Liz did in the causal mediation literature, is we did a review of literature published between 2005 and 2018 that did opioid, now I'm just gonna focus on my opioid work for the moment, but we went ahead and did a literature review of opioid policy evaluations. And as you imagine, you can see, the amount of number of publications has dramatically increased, obviously, as the crisis has unfolded in the country. And as we see things unfolding, methods are getting more robust, but there are still some, some holes in this area in terms of actual practice and, and use of robust methods. So we had 176 studies in total. In terms of how they, the different types of designs we had, most of them were longitudinal designs, but I will note that 15% used cross-sectional designs. And in many of those cases, used that design to dangerously claim potential causal effects. And these were published in good journals. And that is alarming for several reasons that everybody in this room knows. So that's a concern. In terms of the ones that had longitudinal data, we reported a lot of different statistical design issues to help us guide our simulations. And what we found in general, um, uh, there was about 70% that used multi-state, had more than one state, and then there was 30% that were just focused on a single state evaluation of pre-post analysis, <laughs> trying to understand the impact of a policy. So among those that had full longitudinal data and more than one state, we found that most are using difference in difference designs and or the highly related comparative interrupted time series design and about 15% were using GEE. So the big problem from the stats perspective is that we fundamentally don't know which of these models is best. Um, and so we just took a simple tactic to try to figure this out. We said let's do a simulation study where we take real opioid-related mortality data, and we simulate the effect of the policy where we say what's the truth. And we see how well the commonly used methods are doing, the ones that are being published in the applied literature. How are they doing in terms of their statistical properties? And so the focus in this particular simulation, this is just our first one. We have five years, so we're, every year we're going to make this more complex. So this is a simple start. Uh, we focus on state-level data, it's longitudinal repeated measures where it's collected every year. We use real state data on opioid-related mortality. We have all 50 states, 
And in this case, we're going to simulate it so it's staggered adoption, staggered implementation of the policies across the treated states. So in order to actually do our simulation, we have to implement everything in three stages. First, we have to simulate the policy, and we do that over several permutations, you know, from an instantaneous effect to a linear effect, from a small effect to a big one. And we estimate in the second step, we go ahead and apply all the commonly used models that we found in our literature review. And finally, in the last step, we compare how they do versus each other. So here's an illustration of, how, of our simple first step in terms of the simulation. So on the x-axis, I have time, and then on the y-axis, I have the real state-level opioid deaths for 100,000 in the U.S. Each gray line represents a state, and the black line is the national average. So basically, in this first simulation, we went ahead and said, okay, let's, for our sample size, when we do just five states, we consider it anywhere from 1, 5, 15, to 30. But in the case of five, we randomly sample five states. And then we randomly select what date they are going to implement the policy so we can have staggered adoption. And once we have that randomly selected date, we then take their observed outcome and we shift it, depending on the assumed effect of the policy. And so in this last step here, I assume the law is a harmful, which actually was a particularly big issue in the gun policy space. In opioids, you hope that most of them are having a protective effect, but sometimes laws don't. So we did it both ways, and then we summarize across both positive and negative effects. But this is just to illustrate, you know, we're taking real data, we know the truth, and we're simulating a shift in the outcomes based on whatever assumed model we have going in. <coughs> then we compared over 17 different models crossed with a bunch of different standard error estimates. So in total, we have results for 47 models. Uh, we did different GLMs. We had linear, log linear, negative binomial Poisson. We had different regression specifications from simple two-way fixed effects models to autoregressive models, which controlled for lags. Uh, we had population weighted, no weighting, and we did a bunch of different standard error corrections, cluster adjustment, Huber adjustment. Um, but what's interesting is when you start to really look at the performance of these commonly used models, and this reflects what's happening in practice. So this chart is showing you type 1 error rate. And if you immediately notice, the x-axis goes all the way up to 0.5. That's way far away from what we consider an acceptable type 1 error rate. So that immediately should ring alarm bells. Um, what you'll see in these different clusters, first, this is what happens if you don't do any adjustment. This is just showing you results for a two-way fixed effect model. This is if you don't do any kind of standard error adjustment, so it's the worst. This is if you do the Huber, it doesn't really change anything. The most important adjustment is cluster. This is not new. Economics and statistics literature understands that cluster adjustments are extremely critical to have appropriate uh, type <coughs> 1 rates. But what's interesting is even if you do do the cluster adjustment, you still have to get, so these next uh, layers of the graph are the sample size of treated states. So I have 1, 5, 15, and 30. We can't even get to 0.05 with 30 states implementing the law. So that means that the type 1 error rate is still two to three times what we think is considered to be a good model, um, one that you should be uh, not less concerned about false positives. So this is, a, this is an issue and a concern for all of these models. So one of the recommendations coming from this work is that standard error corrections should be used in addition to this just say the cluster adjustment to help ensure that the type 1 error of a model is appropriate. Uh, in terms of power, I did that. The y-axis from 0 to 1 were nowhere near 80% at all. And these lines, so the x-axis is the number of states implementing a policy. Again, from 1 to 30 is what we consider. Then we have five, the true effect of the law, 5%, 15%, 25%. So this is still the linear two-way of fixed effects model. So this is just to say, okay, look, with this commonly used model, we're, the power is really bad in this situation. And no matter what model we use, we don't really ever get high power because this is a really constrained sample to be doing any kind of analysis on. And so I will say that a 5% effect is considered actionable. But we don't have, none of the models have any power to detect such a small effect that would move the needle in terms of actually saving lives. So 
this was concerning. This graph averages across all the different permutations just to put all of the models versus each other in terms of power to show you what the winners were. And basically at the top, what we really found in our, in our simulations is that autoregressive models where you add the lag outcomes can really help in terms of precision. And the negative binomial model is helpful here since this is a count, it's better to model it as a count rather than to use a linear model of the crude rate. So again though, my, my highest number here is 0.25. So the power point is still, the power issue is still a major concern in this space. The other final result is in all of our cases, the impact of how long it takes for a law to become effective uh, the longer it takes, so say it takes two years, three years for a law to fully get enacted, um, the worse the performance gets. So everything is in some ways just going to start to fall apart as you go to a real world setting. So there's a, there are a lot of concerns. <laughs> I'm not going to reiterate them here. But what's important about this work is that it's trying to then put a paper out there that says, look, what's happening in this literature, there needs to be adjustments. We need to be concerned about false positives, and we need to be concerned about power. So use models that will maximize power. But even though it's still not going to fix all the power problems, there are some models that do better than others. And so I think this work is an interesting illustration of what happens when you really look at practice and you try to show, try to teach the fields, these particular applied fields, about the challenges that they're really facing. Now, the bigger issue, which is the point of this session is obviously this space needs new methods and Avi is going to talk soon about a really promising method he put together on multiple synthetic control methods that we'll use in our future simulations which is very promising. Um, I'm not sure though how much even our newest methods are going to get over the power problem. So sometimes I think that introducing a Bayesian framework into this space might be really useful. But no, regardless uh, and I will acknowledge that there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in the econ literature as well as the statistics literature trying to get uh, better models for treatment and effect heterogeneity in this space. So there's some cool stuff happening in, in our field, methodologically. But when you saw what you saw in the literature review is that nobody's using those methods yet. And it's, I'm pretty sure the story's going to continue to, uh, if I predict now if we don't do a better job, it's going to look like her causal, Liz's causal mediation results. You know, 10 years from now, if we don't get better methods straight into the hands of people more easily, these applied statisticians, wherever they are, we're not going to have an impact. And state policymakers are hungry for, to be told what is the truth. You know, what's, what are the policies we shouldn't be investing in? So I want to encourage methods development, but I don't want, I don't want people to not forget that you have to disseminate beyond a peer review publication. And somebody said the other day, but will, it, will that help my tenure? Well, maybe tenure needs to change its requirements because we're, try we're all in this for, for impact eventually, I believe, somewhere, I hope. So, so we need to work on it. Again, I'm going to uh, highlight Jen Starling's Shiny app. I love to see that. We are, my team's been trying to do Shiny apps as well for our results and our methods, so that way it's really easy. You create this point-and-click user interface. It makes it easy for your target audience and other methodologists to reproduce your work and run your models. So I totally support Shiny. Uh, I think you have to get out there and teach courses, workshops, and not just at stats conferences. I'm going to make it. <laughs> it might be 30 seconds over. But, so we have to get out there, and we have to go beyond our circle that we, I think, are most used to. Uh, I encourage websites as well and, and to actively disseminate your work. So, Again, you have to mine the gap. Uh, we were talking about this issue of a pipeline. So it probably takes us one to two years to even do a new method, to develop a new method. And then it takes you another year or two to get it published. And then it takes another however many years for people to even start to think about it, adopting it. Um, so the pipeline is seriously long. And anything we can do to try, I'm curious for everybody's thoughts today, to try to streamline those efforts would be great. So I also was asked to talk about <laughs> the Annals of Applied Statistics, and I do want to tell you that we would love papers that are in this space, bridging theory to practice. We, uh, in addition to wanting in papers with innovative methodology, we also welcome 
really meaningful, robust, state-of-the-art analyses of applied data where the field haven't been welcoming of that, say. So that way we can promote that it's important to be using state-of-the-art methods. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a new method, um, but it's a great home for papers in this space and your work in this space. A lot of you do uh, submit, so I encourage you to keep submitting. And new folks, I invite new submissions from new folks here, too. this over time, but uh, she gave such a good job, and I just decided to give the exemption. One minute over. Anyway, but let us save that time, so. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, that's good collaborators So, last speaker is a uh, panelist is uh, McDaniels. And, uh, uh, Mike is the professor and chair of the Department of Statistics at the University of Florida. And uh, Mike is uh, very well known for his work on um, Bayesian statistics, Bayesian upper matrix, and uh, in the domain of causal inference, he has done quite a lot of uh, great work in mediation analysis. So uh, Mike today was going to talk about a bit about the, the here in practice in terms of Bayesian upper matrix. Sure. So thanks, Anne. Uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. So my, my talk's going to be a little bit um, a little bit different than the other ones. And, um, so what I'm going to talk about is kind of using Bayesian on power metrics to try to kind of bridge this theory to practice gap. And I, I think Bayesian on power metrics are kind of not always thought of that much in terms of causal inference. And <coughs> same only with missing data, but I think there's kind of a lot of really nice features of it that with like appropriate um, dissemination to the right literatures and um, and the creation of kind of pretty general software could be, could be used a lot more than they are now. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you an overview of kind of why I think kind of based on our metrics are kind of a, something that in terms of causal inference we should kind of just add to our toolkit. And I, I don't think we really kind of have them in our toolkit. We've got kind of a lot of semi parametric stuff and all sorts of parametric things. But now there's a lot of stuff going on with machine learning that, that we've heard about. You heard about it, I didn't hear about it, I wasn't here yesterday. Uh, yesterday. I'm assuming the session talk that said machine learning talked about it. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to kind of first say is kind of why might we want to consider Bayesian on parametrics uh, for causal problems. And then I'll just do a simple example with kind of a point treatment exposure kind of just as a, as a starting point. And then I'll kind of go through kind of what I would use like a laundry list of advantages of using kind of Bayesian on parametrics methods. I'll talk a little bit about computations because the computations really are kind of as awful as you might think they would be. And, and for some of these models, you can actually fit them very easily in, in software like JAGS and that sort of thing, which makes it kind of much more amenable. And, and we need to kind of do a better job kind of in the space of, of, of kind of putting together, not just putting together R packages, but putting together kind of friendly R packages. Because there's R packages out there we know that aren't always friendly. If they're not friendly, then you might as well um, and then I'll talk about uh, an extension to basically dynamic treatments and exposures. I'll, I'll probably about here, Van will cut me off and say, no, okay, you can sure come. Um, but if there's time, I'll talk about this, and then I'll just kind of wrap it up. Um, so why might we want to use Bayesian on And I'll talk a little bit more about this first bullet a little bit later. But there's going to be desirable theory, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes, just when we think about kind of of using semi-parametric methods and things, we have kind of consistency and uh, some robustness to model the specification, all that sort of stuff. So um, the Bayesian non-parametrics are going to offer some advantages there. A, a second one that I think is kind of extremely useful, and we'll see as I kind of step through it today, is you can basically have kind of extremely flexible, basically default model specifications. Um, there's a lot of the work we're doing modulo uh, basically machine learning work. A lot of it is just still with kind of linear models or general linear models, trying to find an interaction or trying to find anomaly already. And it's, it's a pretty tall task um, to do it. Though there's been some um, related work on that with, with things like um, super runner and that sort of stuff as well. Um, and the other thing is, anytime you're kind of uh, dealing with kind of causal problems, you're going to have some missing data issues. Um, 
and the way kind of you could potentially fit these things within a Bayesian parametric framework, the missing data will kind of be accounted for under a particular sort of assumption, but without the need to kind of do separate sort of multiple computation models that may not be able to be true simultaneously with the model used for inference, etc. So I'm going to start just with a simple example of point treatment exposure and kind of go through that fairly quickly and then kind of revisit all this stuff. So just think about kind of a very kind of simple setting. Um, well, probably the simplest setting that we could think about in terms of plausible. So we have uh, an outcome Y. Uh, can you even see this one? I Then we have a treatment or exposure, let's call that Z, and then some potential confounders at X. Um, and we can think about it in terms of kind of thinking about causal inference in the setting, we can think about a Bayesian parametric model for basically the outcome regression. So that would be y given z and x. Um, so a, a pretty flexible, easy to kind of implement uh, option for this is what are called these enriched Bayer-Sight process mixtures. And I'm just going to quickly step through this. And, and for those of you who work on basic non parametrics, this is probably familiar. If you don't, it's not, maybe. Um, so here's just here's the outcome regression here for, for uh, subject i. Um, and this is a theta i. Here's basically the distribution of basically all the potential confounders and exposure. Here, we're going to assume those are independent over R. So thinking of where this kind of ends up going is kind of like a latent class sort of model. And then there's a distribution on the parameters of the outcome regression, and there's a distribution on the parameters of the, um, of the confounders. And then this follows this enriched Dirichlet process here, where this is kind of a base measure, which is typically just conjugate priors for these guys, essentially. And then there's two precision parameters that basically um, help determine like how how much do you want to complicate whatever you started out with here, and how much do you want to complicate how you started out with here. The, the reason for the two precision parameters here is you're kind of doing kind of the clustering on the outcome regressions. And then within those outcome regressions, you're doing clustering on basically the confounders to get basically, at the end of the day, we'll see it on the next slide, a very rich joint distribution. <coughs> but the reason for kind of having these two precision parameters here is if you think about, if you just had one, like Y is going to get dominated by a ton of confounders if you have a lot of confounders there. And you're not going to be able to do as good a job with basically the outcome regression here. That's yeah, so that it implies this, don't worry about that. Um, so this um, enriched Dirichlet process, um, and it's basically an enriched Dirichlet process mixture, gives you basically this for the joint distribution. So this just looks like a, a relatively complicated infinite mixture model, right, with weights here associated with the outcome regression, and then weights here associated with basically the confounders conditional on the clusters from the outcome. So again, J is these Y outcome clusters, L given J is the treatment confounder clusters within the Y clusters. These P's are just the distributions we specified on the other thing. And, and what those typically would be, this would probably just be a linear regression model if it's a continuous outcome, or logistic regression, additive, nothing complicated there. And then these for continuous um, confounders, they would be, probably just be normal distributions. Um, if they're binary outcomes, they could be renewable distributions. And then the, the enriched Dirichlet process mixture has weights in this one. Again, that's not particularly important here. Um, and what this specification does, it gives you kind of an extremely flexible kind of outcome regressions without kind of doing any work of trying to like find a good outcome regression. Um, so here's the form of the outcome regression here. So th this could just be a linear regression model. There's weights here. These weights depend on basically the confounders and the treatment. So you end up with kind of a very complex kind of joint distribution here that allows for interactions and nonlinearities in the mean and basically the entire conditional distribution. Um, and to get this, you just basically, if you look at the joint distribution of y and w over the margin on w, you get basically this form. So you get kind of a very, if you think about just kind of a regression setting and trying to kind of find complicated regression models, this is going to kind of slowly kind of get you there. And as the sample size gets big, it's going to give you the right answer. Um, in smaller sample sizes, and with lots of confounders, there's some issues there that I'll talk about um, in a few slides. But the key thing I would say here is that, and I just put it here, it avoids the 
I put it in quotes, but the impossible task of basically finding complex regression models. And that gets even more complicated, right, if you've got like a dynamic treatment where you kind of have the confounders, a bunch of confounders, and then you have those confounders changing over time. So there's like a ton of regression models you basically need to specify correctly. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Well, in principle, I'll talk about that. So again, for the outcome regression that goes basically in here, it's just goes kind of there. It's just like a simple GLM, for example. You could make it more complicated, but if you make it simpler, the computations are kind of much easier. Um, and then the confounder models, I basically said what that is. And then basically under kind of standard sort of causal assumptions, like ignorability here and positivity, and I'll talk a little bit more about positivity at the end. Basically, any causal effects will be identified using kind of what I just specified as like the observed data model. So that's just the model for the observed data. It's not like a causal model or anything like that. I'm just modeling the observed data. Um, and then the G formula can be used to compute causal effects. And I'll talk a little bit about that more. So, um, so what are some advantages of kind of using this based on a parametric approach? I, I talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but I'll kind of go into more detail. So it's going to allow estimation of any causal effects. Because so, we're actually um, basically estimating the entire distribution of the potential outcomes, not just like a mean or a quantile, or whatever the case might be. So you can get quantile causal effects, you can get average causal effects, they'll all kind of fall out of the same model. Um, and then under kind of correctly specified kind of causal assumptions, we'll basically get consistent estimators and basically causal effects with this sort of approach. So we don't have to worry to some extent about kind of the model, the specification issue, assuming that we basically have all the confounders, for example. If not, we can try to do some sensitivity because we don't know if that's true. But under the causal assumptions, everything's pretty much the same thing. Um, so with, with the approach, we're doing the joint distribution of kind of the outcome and the confounders of the treatment. Um, so basically, any sort of missingness in the confounders are basically going to be automatically handled under an assumption of ignorable missingness. If ignorable missingness isn't appropriate, you can try to kind of appropriately like, augment it. But it's going to kind of deal with basically MAR missing this in kind of confounders just in an automatic sort of way, just in terms of the computations. Again, if ignorable missing this isn't appropriate, then well, it doesn't help with that. But, but it avoids the issue of kind of using only complete cases, um, which is sometimes done in, in, in um, electronic health record studies where you just say if they have complete data, we're going to use them, and if not, we're not going to use them as an inclusion criteria, which creates a bias. That there. And it also kind of avoids the issue of a separate imputation model. And once you start doing a separate imputation model, there's pretty much no chance it's going to be able to be true simultaneously with your outcome regression model. They're likely going to contradict each other, so you can't get um, essentially consistent estimators of causal effects. And a lot of the default imputation models that are used, as we know, use that chain equation stuff, which doesn't even give you a valid joint distribution in those situations as a separate sort of. In terms of computations, computations are actually pretty straightforward, um, relatively efficient, and you can parallelize the, you can super parallelize it. Um, and I'll talk about what I mean there. So that in terms of MCMC sampling, you can basically just use an algorithm uh, that's relatively simple from the we're, we're trying to kind of code this up so it's kind of appropriately user-friendly to everybody. Um, Again, you can deal with missing confounders with data augmentation. You can actually do a truncation approximation to this, similar to what people use for Gershon process mixtures and fit the thing in JADs. Though that's not particularly efficient. And then in terms of kind of, so you do your posterior sampling using this enriched Gershon process mixture, and then you basically need to do G computation to basically get the causal effects. Um, and this is kind of written kind of generally here. So the G computation steps can all be done in parallel. Um, and these sort of problems in general, you can, if with um, the advantage of kind of supercomputers and stuff, there's a lot of parallelization that you can do. Um, so in terms of this Monte Carlo integration, basically, assuming you have enough cores, right, you can kind of, it's get, the time it takes to do this Monte Carlo integration would be the time it takes to just do one Monte Carlo integration. And then we've kind of done a lot of this parallelization in practice for kind of different sort of Yeah, and then in terms of kind of increasing the number of confounders, the local independence helps a lot with that. Okay. 
okay, in terms of extending to like the longitudinal setting, the, 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 the equivalent sort of gene computation step under sequential adorability would look something like this. Okay, so the, the key thing here is if you think about these things in terms of tackling the problem using gene computation, if k is kind of big, and dep depending on the dimension of xk here, there's like a ton of distributions that you'd have to specify correctly. To the extent of, you're, in most ways that you do it, that, that there's little hope of kind of getting them all right. Um, so you could just do kind of an extension of kind of what I was talking about, where you replace w with all these guys. The issue with that, you might think, is that I just mentioned it. If k is large and this is large, it's probably not going to be particularly efficient because you'd be doing the local independence of all the components of, um, of x bar k and z bar k. So what you could do kind of within this simple EVP mixture, again, is to basically just think about these. Oh my God. Let me see if I can. There we go. Think about um, these regressions here and kind of put them in as simple linear models and simple probit models or whatever the case might be to put some structure in there, um, which would be similar to like a parametric G computation sort of thing. And then the BNP machinery will kind of enrich it with that as the base. And there's not really kind of a ton of time to talk about this because I'm probably down to like 20 seconds or something. But, um, so let me just kind of wrap up here. So, um, so Bayesian non-parametrics is, a, is a, um, a promising approach for practical implementation of causal inference. Um, and we've done similar developments to what I talked about here in terms of causal mediation and multiple mediators um, and that sort of thing. So the potential complications here um, are kind of, if you have kind of high dimensional joint distributions, i.e. potentially like a lot of confounders, for example, you probably want to try to do some sort of variable selection and kind of how to do that. It's a little bit more complicated here because it's not just, when you're doing variable selection with linear models, their betas are being zero. Here it's kind of a little bit more complicated to do that, but there's uh, relevant literature in um, computer science and that sort of thing that have kind of looked at these sort of things, and in statistics. Um, there's always concerns about positivity violations, um, which uh, a lot of fans work with the weighting kind of, or trying to kind of get at that, like, we're kind of working on some of that thing, and that gets worse with like longitudinal data, right? Uh, MCMC for large N, maybe variational bays might be the best or an issue with that, and how to use the propensity score on these things is kind of a little bit of an open for issue as well. So I'll stop there because that was my also right. Okay, thanks. Now, everyone, uh, so we are now open to the floor discussion. So we really have a uh, oh, wonderful. Um, Talks and uh, now I think Liz has something to say, opening to say about the theme, and then I think I'm pretty sure we have plenty of questions. And I can see Laura sitting down there, definitely have plenty of questions for Bazan about difference in difference and that type of things. So, um, so yeah, now we're open to the uh, so Liz will give the open discussion, and then you will just feel free to answer ask questions. Great, thank you. I, is this working? Okay, yes. I just want to make a point that I think um, is like an over, overall sort of thing I've been pondering, which is that that they mentioned one pipeline. I think there's another sort of pipeline, which is that there's a pipeline from theoretical development to application in, say, psychology. And I want to be clear, I, I wouldn't expect everyone in this room to do that whole pipeline. I, I, my strength is not theoretical development. Other people, might, their strength might not be the communication of methods with psychology researchers. So one point maybe we could talk about as a group is sort of how do we kind of make sure though that, that those links happen. I was at something recently and they sort of made the point that you kind of just, you need to be able to communicate sort of to the next leg in this, that sort of you have people who do theoretical development, they need to be able to <coughs> sort of connect with the sort of methods people who might be able to write the software and then they need to be able to talk to the people like me who can then work with collaborators and then I need to be able to talk with the collaborators. And so I just wanted to open that up that, again, I don't know, like, not, not everyone is good at every piece of that, but I think, and, and the point I want to make, too, is that we need to value each of those pieces. 
Um, and I think one of the things I'm loving about this meeting is that we have people who represent that spectrum in the same room. And so I'm learning a lot about the theoretical side and hopefully other people might be learning a little bit about the sort of application side. But I would just love to figure out ways that we can make sure that that continuum happens and that each of those pieces is valued by our community. Um, so anyway, that was my like little thing that I wanted to make sure to say. So anyone else want to say something or questions? I can send to Laura. <laughs> okay, you're right. I do have a question. Hold on. I'll, I'll give you the... I know, and I'm apologizing because I forgot to tee up Laura's talk tomorrow because she's oh, going to no, be no, talking no. about the cha in more depth the challenges of difference and difference modeling. So. Well, thank you, and I'm also going to be referring <laughs> back to you all tomorrow morning. Uh, I have like a thousand questions for Beth Ann. I'm going to try to limit it to maybe two. Uh, so normally I think of type 1 error and power as being in a trade-off situation where either you have well-controlled type 1 error or high power but never both. This looks like, from the things you showed, like the worst of both worlds, right? You both have really high type 1 error and super low power. And specifically I wondered about so I how you're thinking about those trade-offs yeah. and permutation inference, whether which, which seems like maybe a fix to one but worse on the other. So, okay, in terms of the power, I think I need to update that label because we actually, it's, cor it's the correct rejection rate. So what we did to all the models to, in order to not unfairly compare models with type, high type 1 error to those with more close to 0.05, we did a uh, standard error correction before we went and did power analyses. So we, we, so we leveled the field in terms of that. And in the paper, I, I, for a little bit, I was calling it correct rejection. I think I might need to go back to that because it's not the kind of a classic power of just the statistical, whether it comes up with statistically significant uh, result or it would be much higher, like you said. So that's an important distinction that I made there. In the permutation, I haven't tested that, so it might be something to add in to see. It's just sort of like one of the few techniques that I think has to started to proliferate in the applied literature, partly due to the Abadi uh, yeah. 2010 paper where they did permutation inference and people are thinking like maybe that's better than Stata's common yep. cluster, which I make fun of. Yeah, and that's something we can add. Well, and stay tuned for Avi's talk tomorrow, which will cover a similar, or no, later today. So. You don't even have to wait until Yeah, and I, w I guess one thing I'll say is the Shiny, the, the current simulation is going to be put into Shiny app so that we can test any new model. We can, you know, all the code will be available, and so we want to be putting more and more methods in to show how they perform now that this tool is created. And the simulations will be getting more complex. So building off of the work that you've been doing. Um, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing where, you know, I would love to talk more about the specifics. So that was a very technical question. I want to open more broadly to the panel, if you'll if permit me a second question. Uh, this question of where we publish and how we move things along through the pipeline. <laughs> Beth Ann, I'm delighted to hear that you think Annals wants to publish sort of minding the gap papers. I wonder how you all feel about the idea that we as methodologists should be publishing in our domain-specific collaborators journals. Should we be publishing in psych and econ and gun policy journals instead of in our own domain-specific journals, even though the tenure people want us to publish in animals? I'm biased and I would like you to publish in your domain <laughs> so that way you teach the applied area the latest and greatest work. So. Um, and, and I don't think it's an either or. I think it can be an and. I mean, you publish the sort of slightly more technical version. I mean, sometimes you have to be a little careful about not showing the exact same results in two places. Like, it's a little bit of a balance, but I'm a huge fan of the sort of slightly methods -y, the methods -y paper, but then also because honestly, the applied journals are often so short, like the papers are so short, you don't have time to talk about the, like, the details. Um, so I, I say and not. Yeah, so I, I was just going to say something in terms of just kind of publishing the domain journals. There's kind of there's kind of two ways to be doing that. One is kind of you're you're working on the collaboration thing. You're like using these methods, kind of in a specific thing. And that, and even with the Bayesian non-power metrics, we've been kind of doing that in, in a couple of papers uh, recently within um, like the obesity literature essentially. But then there's the um, right the more time-consuming writing piece that. Uh, I think we're also referring to, which is kind of writing kind of the, the methodology for kind of the domain specific. Like a thing. tutorial. Right. Yeah, I, we do a lot of tutorials geared in substance abuse journals to try to teach people about the methods using a case study, and I think those manuscripts are helpful. Hi. 
I was wondering if uh, you could comment on what extent uh, you believe that some of the excitement and uh, pedagogy surrounding machine learning, specifically deep learning, and how that could serve as a template for communicating causal inference with uh, potential users. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, so with things like deep learning, it's, it, it's kind of used, it's being used a lot, but I, I think one thing that's um, critical when methods start getting kind of being used a lot, that people should have some idea of kind of what actually is happening with it. And I don't think that's the case with deep learning. I think for kind of a lot of the stuff we're talking about here, yeah, we'd like we'd like people to be using it, but we'd also like on some level for people to like understand what they're actually doing, not have this just kind of insanely opaque black box of yeah, it does good things, but I don't really even understand what it's actually doing. And I'll just echo that and also echo Lane's, I love Lane's point about when we write software or make tools available in general or write papers, the more we can automate diagnostic steps along the way to sort of show people like when can they sort of understand that a method is working and actually like recent, it's funny I was talking with a computer scientist recently about some um, sort of natural language processing stuff and I was like well so how will I know if this is sort of like screwing up like will there be like what can I be looking for to make sure the choices are reasonable and he was like you statisticians always ask that. <laughs> I was like, Yes, we do. Um, and he had a reasonable response. Um, and so, but that was a helpful conversation. And the more we can sort of help that conversation along to, to show people what kind of, in some ways, what the pitfalls are or the things to look out for when they're actually applying a method, um, I think it'll be incredibly useful. I was just thinking about when I'm doing workshops with applied researchers in addiction, I do actually use machine learning, uh, uh, machine learners to estimate propensity score weights. And I show them, you know, how machine learning, even though it is a black black box, have actually made, has improved causal inference because it's allowed us to get higher quality propensity score weights by comparing two classic logistic regression options. And so I do think that even though it is a black box and it can be overwhelming, I think we can make it accessible if we try to show them, you know, through balance tables or whatever it might be, that it, it does actually can help. And, and therefore, even though it is black box, it's one worth using. So we just have to make it accessible. But I do think, obviously, machine learning and causal inference both are helping each other out <laughs> uh, right now. Hi, this is great. Um, I'm Jake Bowers from the University of Illinois. Um, one thing I, I would like to mention is I think there's going to be a tremendous growth in jobs for the kinds of people that you're talking about. I mean, it, it, I think. I, with the Evidence-Based Policy Act in the U.S. government, every agency has to has to appoint an evaluation officer whose job it is to, is to do causal inference inside of the U.S. government. So, in fact, we may have not just the, the statistician and the applied person, but there'll be these the need for st the statistical scientists inside of the governments themselves. And I know this is happening in cities. In countries, and that's just in my in what I see in the policy space. I'm not even seeing the addiction space or the health space. So I, I think this is like more and more of our students are going to actually be sitting with it, doing applied work directly, and it'll be ever more important for the people doing more the theory work to be supporting those people who are who are on the teams themselves. Sorry, I was just thinking about how, in some ways, I guess it's it's also important that in those positions, the organizations support people's use of the robust state-of-the-art methods, because that is obviously something that's ingrained in everywhere we work, and so, you know, that's our job, but we have to make sure that organizations value putting time into people's training so that they're using whatever the latest and greatest method is from the field. We like to actually invite them to this yeah. meeting. Like, we should be, there should be these moments where even if you work inside the federal government, you come here once every two years, in essence. And how can you feel like you have a sense of community, a community of practice, um, in addition to your, your, your daily job? So sort of creating those moments, um, are, I think, is an important thing that uh, a group like this or other professional organizations can roll in as well. So I'll, I'll follow on that. Um, I'm not in 
academia. I'm a practitioner. I'm a statistical consultant and I'm a generalist. Sometimes people pay me to do causal inference. Sometimes they pay me to do other things. When someone says, hey, I want to pay you to do causal inference, I say, here's my hourly rate. They've got in their head some notion of a deadline that's usually not realistic and some notion of how much they're going to spend that's also usually not realistic. And I have to work within that. And I can usually push it out a little bit, but only so much. So I've got a limited amount of time to learn the appropriate method that I need to use. Now, I have a PhD in statistics from NC State. I'm here at SAMC. Obviously, I'm aware that there's an academic community that's, and as all of you said, where you guys are is like here, and many, many, many orders of magnitude behind you is where people are using the methods. Um, absolutely everybody needs causal inference. Um, everybody. And even like, I just, I just came out of working for a Fortune 500 company that's utterly clueless. Like, So here I am, looking at the list of working groups. Um, I don't, I'm not seeing anything that has anything to do with bridging the gap in the working groups. And that is disappointing. So I'm requesting one. Um, I would love to be part of it. I don't think I could lead it in terms of technical expertise. Um, but I would love to be a part of it and lead it in terms of scheduling the meetings. I can do that. Um, but I, I would love to kind of come up with, or, and I, I remember, Lane, you said something about a tutorial that Liz or somebody had, and I'm like, where, where is it? Where do I get it? You know, so please, if, if there's some kind of systematic way we can say, this is your problem. You have this type of response variable, these types of, um, you know, the, the, the situations that I'm talking about are so much more complex than also what I've seen addressed in the methods, but... You know, you've got a regression model that has all these variables. One of them is the treatment. Um, I'm not seeing interactions being talked about at all, and that's very alarming to me because they're very important. Um, and I guess maybe you're calling that mediators or moderators. So there you go. That's my... I don't use those words. Um, anyway, I would love to have a working group on bridging the gap. Well, I will say your wish is granted. <laughs> I admit that I come up with all the name of a working group because it's my job. I have to come up with something before people even show up. So I made the name that. I, and the key thing is I need to find people who are willing to devote time, uh, you know, during the discussion. So if you want, great. <laughs> Give me the name, and uh, I will ask uh, Samsi to put the uh, put a button, uh, put a website that that you can discuss and the work with people, so welcome. Um, and, and same thing for anyone else, if uh, I, obviously the, the list I put, put up there is by no means it's a complete list of the topics in called the inference, it's purely I could find people who can put to work. Um, so again, if you have any ideas, you really want to have a lively discussion, uh, a semester long discussion, continuous work uh, on some topics, let me know and then I will communicate to Samsi. I just want to respond to a few uh, points based on my own experience. Um, so firstly, Elizabeth, uh, you made some nice remarks about, you know, that we should value every component of what statistics is about. And one component is the translation of the real world into a formal statistical estimation problem, which requires some notion of notation, doesn't need, require that you need to prove things. So you can have phenomenal statisticians who can do that job. Then there is the actual, maybe, you know, formal mathematical proofs, analysis, there's the computing. Um, so it's, it's an incredible diverse set of skills, which makes sense. We're talking about the science of learning from data. I mean, that is it. Right? It's, the, it's, it's what it's all about. So in my experience, you know, when I work with students, I always look for that you know, person to get a sense of what they are and who they want to be. And that just takes time, right? We are going to move towards a priori specified machines. 
It's the only way. You can act that's not the way if you're in the world of academic publishing. Because then you can do whatever you want. But if you are a place like the FDA who has to make big decisions which count and which have consequences, there is no other way. It has to be a priori specified. Then you can say, let's do a priori specified something which is just bad. No. Let's have a machine. So we are going to have machines. But they are still built in this general framework of having a you know, clear understanding of what the statistical model is, which is probably we know very little. We have a clear understanding of what the target estimate is. We have the understanding of to what degree it might be causal. And now comes the estimation, and we want an estimate, and we want inference. Okay? And that's where machine learning comes in. And that's, for example, what you asked about deep learning. Yeah, deep learning is, is important. Okay? It's another big chunk of incredible advances in machine learning. They are important to learn these stochastic relations of what the, how the future depends on the past. So they're part of it. And all of it, uh, very important. Like, uh, now going back to Daniel, so you mentioned that something like a black box, right, that's, you have to kind of know what you're doing, but you just yourself presented advanced Bayesian learning, right? With, based on highly flexible models. You know, I'm in favor, right? I'm not criticizing. But I'm just saying, that's also a complex algorithm, right? So in other words, yeah, you know, but I'm, what there I'm is saying, no other way these methods are going to be complex as long as we can trust their statistical properties. That's the fundamental part. And I, I only see in the way you give your presentations and how you have been you know, developing further and further, I see that only happening, <laughs> moving you in the same direction. The thing is with kind of those based on parametric approaches, which I think is kind of uh, attractive of them, it's it pretty, there, there wasn't kind of time to kind of go into the thing, but they're actually pretty transparent when you actually start using them in general versus kind of... But it's um, still a machine. No, it's still a machine, there right? And it's kind of finding kind of complex relationships in kind of automated sort of ways. Yeah. But I would say it's kind of much less black box than some of the other stuff basically that's out there. We can chat about it now. Yeah, on that note, let's uh, end this one for discussion, and uh, I'm pretty sure that we will have discussion offline. And uh, let's thank our wonderful speakers again.